Greetings, adventurers, and well-met Master of Dungeons here on the Master of Dungeons Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash the Master of Dungeons, where we talk all things D&D, Dungeons and Dragons, world's greatest role-playing game, except for Mondays. We do take a small little break. Uh, we streamed Tuesday through Friday and Sunday evenings. Uh, Tuesday through Friday afternoons, I should say, and Sunday evenings, uh, Dungeons and Dragons content, live play game on Sunday evenings, uh, a little bit of video game play with Baldur's Gate 3, and... Dungeon Master Advice. Been Dungeon Master for over 40 years and uh, recently became a professional Dungeon Master about three years ago, three and a half years ago. Uh, and just like to give my uh, my perspective on things here on my platform. Uh, but today is uh, Dungeons and Deliberations. It is Tuesday. And uh, Dungeons and Deliberations, we basically just go through some DM prep and uh, ask or answer questions from any viewers that uh, happen to stop by. Uh, if they have any questions about being a DM, uh, any questions about uh, Dungeons and Dragons in general. Um, but uh, in the event that we don't have any uh, one asking questions, I just go through and go through some DM prep today. Uh, Planescape Adventures in the Multiverse came out. Uh, it was released. It's also on Roll20. D&D &D Beyond, The Life, uh, Three book set came out as well. I think there's also a uh, DM screen in there. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and create our base room in Rule 20. I'm basically, any time I have a buy a new adventure, a hardcover, whether it be from WotC or from a third party, uh, I'll go through and create a base room. Uh, and then I'll put in all my little uh, things that I have added into all my different rooms. Um, in that room and then i'll use that as a base so if i happen to have a client game where clients want me to run a hey let's go through the turn of fortunes wheel module uh i can go ahead and you know pick that up and uh copy this room and uh have that room ready for them to play in so that's what we're going to do let's go ahead and create this new room it's going to take a few seconds for the uh thing to show up here should have the Planescape logo. Um, I don't think this is going to affect our creation of the room. We're going to go ahead and add our token markers to it. Uh, we actually went through there's gameicons.net, uh, which is actually the same tokens that Roll20 uses, the free. Um, Creative Commons Zero, I believe, um, that you can use. I don't sell them, obviously, uh, or, or uh, anything like that, uh, but you can uh, utilize those and put them in your own to token marker set if you want. I do need to go through and redo one of my markers as the uh, outline is not even close to what the rest of them were. <laughs> hmm. Why was it not dropping that file in there? It looks like the game's ready to go. We'll find out here shortly. Yeah. Uh, first thing I always do is since we use, uh, I, I haven't used, I might have updated it, uh, the, the audio video uh, for Rule 20. Uh, normally, the default is if you uh, use voice and video, your microphone, your camera will be going through Rule 20 as well. It does load it, uh, does um, cause a little bit of a lag for those that don't have an exceptionally good internet connection. Uh, but what we end up doing is we always, since we use Discord for most of our uh, stuff anyway, video chat and uh, voice chat, uh, I always go through and just turn the integrated voice and video off. Or restart the, uh, or re, uh, fresh the rule 20. And personally, myself also, I'm not a big fan of my, just for my, uh, viewing on the screen. I like to have more of the screen that I can see. Sometimes I'll even get rid of the chat, uh, up there. Uh, you can also collapse this over here if you want to as well. Uh, but I always go through, go to my settings and then I'll go to the graphics again. Oh, graphics there, audio and video, sorry. I'm going to video, and then I'll always put uh, just names only. All right, so let's, let's see what's in the uh, adventure here. Got a few different maps. 
Now, what I was reading about the uh, Planescape game is that the characters, the players, will create three characters, uh, from what I understand. Dynamic lighting example, Rule 20 tips. We can go ahead and, we don't ever delete those pages, but we do archive them. Now, I do have to, I do want to check something out here first. Let's go to the token page. Ooh, nice. The spoilers, of course, if you're not wanting to find out anything about Planescape before playing it. <laughs> really cool new art and tokens. X01. <laughs> Lots of rather gargantuan creatures here. That's huge. Philia Kopoa. Kopoa. It's huge, 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 large. Interesting, interesting. Uh, I'm going to actually exit out real quick and come back in because I'm going to see if I can get these settings. Well, still, for some reason, that file is not popping up in there. That's not good. I'm going to go to game settings and see if we can change the settings out here. I'm trying to remember where that was. There we go. Also wanted to do the game add-on for our safety cards. Hmm, give me a second here. Oh, we don't want that to load. Oh, 
All right, so then we're going to go through. Now, it's very weird because some adventures that I load in, some of the campaigns and such, uh, the creatures already are set to not whisper rolls. Because I do roll my rolls and roll 20 out in the open. Uh, when I'm playing at conventions and live play, I still sometimes use, I'll most of the time, still use a uh, DM screen. But most of that's for hiding the information from the players, all the other stuff like that. So let's see if there's actually... Nope. Hmm. Another reason why I'd go through and do these updates on the uh, token page is that way when you actually go to the maps, like some of these maps obviously look like they're going to be larger. Um, let me see. Let's check this one out. Nope, that one's about the same size. Some of the maps, like from Strahd and such like that, the creatures are going to be, when you pull them out, they're like the squares, like half size. Uh, you don't want to update that default token for that page because then every token you pull out is going to be small uh, like that because it does take that size into account. Oh, Planescape. One of my top settings that i really really enjoy obviously i'm a big ravenloft fan was well, really big into dark sun in the first and second or first and second edition when it came out but uh it is definitely a problematic world for uh inclusiveness <laughs> that is for sure which i definitely understand them not wanting to necessarily uh revisit that for fifth edition Well, let's check out some of the other maps while we're looking at them. <laughs> Horton's Wheel Casino, maybe? Most likely? Ooh, very colorful map. Yep, Casino. This is like... Let's see, uh, Call of Another Deep. There was a casino. Keys from the Golden Vault Casino. Planescape Casino. <laughs> Ooh, that's really cool looking. Outside view of that structure. Now I'll go through also, uh, not necessarily today, but when I go through to finish prepping, is I still have to finish uh, an adventure after the stream that's over today, and then I still have a client room to finish setting up for uh, some ho some Halloween themed adventures over the Halloween weekend, and then I still have to prep <laughs> another uh, set of rooms for next month's virtual D&D weekend. And still uh, finish for some prep for next Sunday's stream of Fantail from Below the Shattered Obelisk. Lots and lots of stuff to do. Plenty of time to do it, I hope. Uh, just going to check through the next map. That's the Walking Castle hideout. Again, spoilers, if you're watching this, of course, uh, on Video on Demand on YouTube, you're going to uh, see some spoilers. Looks like these are all Mike Schley maps. Schley, Schley. I think it's Schley. Uh, 
I actually went through, he has, has a assets, asset packs that he has for a campaign cartographer um, three. And uh, every time he has a new one of the uh, asset packs come out, I always grab those and try to do the best I can to make my maps look as similar uh, to his as possible. Uh, just to kind of keep that immersion that players are kind of used to seeing. Uh, in our, some of the, uh, like, I think it was starting with uh, Waterdeep, maybe? Waterdeep Dragon Heist, I think? What was before that? That would have been Season 8, 7, that was Tomb of Annihilation. So yeah, Waterdeep, that was when Dyson Logos started doing a lot of the cartography, which is really cool. He had a really uh, retro look to his stuff, and we actually, I use a lot of his maps. Uh, he has some commercial maps that are available for free use uh, that we use uh, some of those for our Dreams of the Red Wizards campaign to try to keep the uniformity through all of the uh, different adventures and such like that. Interesting. Looks like it's a bird, but it's some sort of vessel, but it's on water. <laughs> okay, to Asheroff. Ooh, this looks a really colorful, interesting map. And this would be an example of one of those maps where the uh, media, like, for example, this right here is, I believe, a gargantuan token, maybe. This would be like the size of a medium or small creature, I believe. So these are going to be like 10 foot squares. Similar to this map as well. No, maybe not. Nope. Outlands. Mm. Mm. As you might have seen on the uh, YouTube videos that uh, D and D Beyond and D and D put out, uh, it was pronounced Sigil, but you of course can pronounce it Sigil if you wish. Uh, when I used to play back in the day. Uh, I always called it Sigil myself until I found out that it's pronounced Sigil. I'll sometimes slip it up. So if we happen to stream some Planescape adventures, uh, <laughs> I will probably mispronounce it and call it Sigil a lot. <laughs> well, there's the top of the spire right here in the middle. All the different towns leading to the different cities, or leading to the different uh, outer plains, I should say. River sticks. Maybe they have, they have a representation of sticks anywhere out there. Really cool. Sigil poster. Sigil, see, I just did it again. Which one's the upper part of the ring and the lower part of the ring? Are the inner or outer? I can't remember which. As you can see, the city here itself is all round inside this thing here at the top of the uh yes epic shelter welcome in planescape came out today well it's been on dnd beyond i think if you got the pre-order you would have had access to it last week uh, but it did come out today on rule 20 
and we are going through and setting up a base room, not going through all the boring stuff of uh, what I normally do when I set up my base rooms for uh, the different adventures when they come out, but just kind of going through and exploring it a little bit today. So beware of spoilers. <laughs> How's your day or afternoon or evening been so far? Hopefully good. Let's go back over here to the uh, Outlands poster. I want to do something real quick before I forget. I always forget to do this. Oh, that's how large some of those maps are. Look how far we're zoomed out. <laughs> I want to go through. Uh, let's go to map settings real quick. I always like to turn the grid on. And then turn the, uh, oh, the grid is on. And it's okay. <laughs> Rock and roll. They're starting to do what I do all the time. <laughs> doing well, doing well. Just working on uh, some stuff here. And then, uh... oh no, I've, uh, I I'm, was nicknamed the master of dungeons by some of my friends years ago, because I've been a DM for over 40 years. So I've been playing, uh, I've played every edition of Dungeons and Dragons. I have DM'd, well, I've played a couple sessions of uh fourth edition. It wasn't really my cup of tea, so I went back to three five. Uh and then of course I love fifth edition because of the fact that it is so it's got a very retro feel, very vintage feel compared to like the old because I learned with the uh Moldave box sets back in the day when I first started wanting to play and uh, became a DM back in that uh, was eighty three, yeah. August of eighty three. And uh yeah, when uh Planescape came out, loved it. Uh, I actually went through and I hadn't played the video game for Planescape, Planescape Torment um, back in the day. I didn't have a chance to play that, but I did just recently pick it up on Steam. They had a, a deluxe reissue of it or something like that. I haven't had a chance to jump into that yet either, but no. Love Planescape. Used to have all of the uh, second edition uh, stuff, box sets and everything. And that's my familiar, by the way. <laughs> All right, so here's some of the content. This is just going to have... Now, I do have, obviously, we can go into the uh, compendium and search all the stuff for Planescape, uh, the uh, uh, other boxes, but the adventure itself is just the Turn of Fortunes uh, uh, Turn of Fortunes wheel, which happens to be, again, as I mentioned earlier, a casino. <laughs> wow. 13 chapters. Oh, wow. 15 chapters. Interesting. Ugh. Named NPCs. Lots of awesome player art, it looks like. Oof. Beautiful. Oh. Dungeon Land. Oh, that's a throwback to a... AD&D adventure. Yeah, it does look like a bunch of uh, older artwork or style. Yeah. Matter of fact, let's check the credits. Mm. Let's just going to have, there we go. Here's my familiar. My apologies. She's going to be very loud. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, that's what I was saying. The Dungeon Land reference uh, to the uh, old uh, Alice in Wonderland style adventure with that artwork. The player handout. Let me shut some of these, close some of these out. Yeah, the artwork Dungeon Land. <laughs> in Dungeon Land, otherworldly gamers bet on adventures across the plains. <laughs> That's really cool. Feywild looking stuff. Yeah, I believe um, we partner with Baldwin Games and Wizards of the Coast, uh, Wizards of the Coast, and we do uh, virtual D&D &D weekends, or I do virtual D&D &D weekends uh, once a month. Uh, we also work with BMG. Um, as they for I play a lot of organized play, which is uh, the Adventurers League as well as homebrew stuff. Um, the pandemic hit in 2020 or no, 2019, 2020. Um, a lot of play went to virtual play online. Uh, Bowman Games is what they're called. Uh, they uh, run all of the D and D uh, content for uh, Gen Con. Uh, Winter Fantasy, Origins, Game Fair, PAX East and West and such like that. PAX Unplugged. Um, they did New York Comic Con this year. They do uh, a bunch of stuff. But we had started, we're, I, I started with them, um, I think 2017, 2018, something like that. Going to different conventions, running D&D for them as well. I had done it myself back in the past. Uh, I'd run a bunch of mostly homebrew stuff uh most of the 2000s uh, and then started back doing conventions with them uh, within the past five, six, seven years or whatever. And uh, we actually, they, with the Adventures League organized play, um, it's basically Dungeons and Dragons uh, with the rules as written. Uh, basically everything as the rules are in the game, you don't use any variants or anything like that. There's no DM house rules or anything like that. Well, I basically tell people if they're going to play Adventures League it's uh, and you're going to DM, it's basically everyone uses the same house rules, which are just the rules as written uh, in the game without any variance. And it makes it to where the characters are portable. So you could play a Adventures League game at your local game store. Uh, you play that character, keep your logs of uh, what you've played, uh, and then take that character uh, to a convention and play it at a convention, uh, the same character, uh, and you level up with the Adventures League rules, how you level up and such. And then you can take that character and play online. Uh, you can also run an Adventures League home uh, campaign with your friends, uh, as long as you play by Adventures League rules and you know record all of your uh, adventures logs and such like that. And with that, they normally would, they used to write like when Tyranny of Dragons and uh, what was it, Rise of Tiamat, her. Uh, yeah, Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Tiamat. And when all that stuff uh, came up, all the way through, I want to say, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, they wrote uh, adventure modules, uh, just like one, you know, four hour session, two hour session adventure that would uh, kind of follow along in the same um, area that the hardcover went, through, went with. But it just had a, a kind of a slightly different, a little bit of a, a different storyline. And they've actually turned those adventures over to uh, having Baldwin Games uh, work on those. Uh, so the Dragonlance adventures have come out, or the Dragonlance uh, Shadow of the Dragon Queen came out. So uh, a friend of mine, John Christian, is, uh, and Alan Patrick is the star, the story leads for the, uh, adventure, the Adventures League ventures uh, for those. And I'm the story lead along with uh, Cassandra McDonald. She and I are the... Uh, co-story leads for the dreams of the red wizards campaign which is a watsi uh adventure line that they ran uh for uh, a number of i think three story arcs and we're uh actually finishing up the fourth story arc here soon uh, we premiere them online and then they uh after we uh, have a few uh months of play testing with uh, the online players and stuff at our virtual D, &D weekends uh, we'll go back through and tweak them and publish them on the dungeon masters guild and we actually have, with Baldwin Games, they're going to be doing some Planescape uh, Adventures League adventures. Now, keep in mind, you don't have to play Adventures League to run these adventures and play them. Uh, they're really good, cool storylines and such like that. Uh, fairly inexpensive adventures. Like, if you went back through in first edition, second edition, you went out and actually bought modules. They didn't really do, like, uh, the hardcover adventures like they do now. It was, you know, hey, I can go out and buy an adventure for, like, six bucks or seven bucks. It's kind of like that uh, on uh, the uh, Dungeon Master's Guild. Ooh. 
colorful. They do have access to so many artists because of Magic the Gathering as well, so you have a lot of great art. Ooh. It's like a Modoc style mandra, a Modron. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you had basically uh, your get your quests. And you do this kind of like a not. I don't want to say. I like to say use the word linear as a you know it has a linear story to to a lot of it. Not as uh, much open sandbox stuff uh, as it were. like the hard. A lot of the hard covers are really kind of open. Not really. I want to say sandbox because you still have to you know can only really go which direction with the, DM, the information the DM gives you. Uh, but yeah, some of those old adventures are really fun because, the, you know, you sit down and have a good four hour, sometimes two sessions. I mean, we used to play like 12 hour sessions over the weekends in middle school and high school, sometimes 24 hours over a weekend. <laughs> yeah, it's, it does take like, for example, I always explain with to help DMs out because I also help train and mentor the DMs for uh, Baldwin Games as well. Um, I always try to make sure that the the uh, the DMs you always want to give the players choice or what I also call the illusion of choice. Um, or as you, they only the players always have to rely on the information. They only know the information that the DM gives them. And if the DM doesn't give them enough information, it definitely can seem railroady. And a lot of DMs, especially the newer DMs, do have a tendency to, you know, like what I always tell everybody in Adventures League, it's rules as written, not run as written. Uh, you can have fun with the adventures. So you're still the dungeon master. You're still the storyteller. Uh, that I, I, Like I said, I always say that... Uh, the players happen to be the heroes and they're playing the, the heroes of the story. So let's tell that story together. Yeah. I think the, let's see the wild beyond the witch light was kind of more of a linear story because it had to go from the witch light carnival then to the different sections of uh, that. Um, obviously the, Adventures that have or the hardcovers like Keys from the Golden Vault, Radiant Citadel, those were all short adventures that were kind of very linear. Um, very linear also in uh, Dragonlance. I mean, there's options in different places to go. I think the the most non-linear adventure they've had in a while was the Rhyme of the Frostmaiden. Let's there's the planner parade. This is nice. It does give us access to we can find stuff from the uh, other two books. So the adventure is designed for characters of three, third to 10th level with a dramatic jump to level 17. Oof. <laughs> so check out the character options. See what we got here. Which is something that's new that they're going to be coming out with. They started this with, uh, oh, what was it? I know they put it into, um, oh, a plane, or, uh, Spelljammer. That's uh, where they started it, uh, putting backgrounds in that have uh, feet in their uh, background as a background feature instead of having like the, uh, like with the Urchit, you have you, the uh, city secrets where you can move through cities and stuff like that. Really doesn't do a whole bunch necessarily mechanically. Uh, the backgrounds were more um, open to the DM interpretation of how the DM wanted to deal with it. Uh, and they're switching to putting in feats now. So if you have a background without a uh, feat, obviously you can take 
uh, skilled or tough. Uh, I think in uh, Planes or in Spelljammer, I think they also had Magic Initiate Cleric, I think, something like that. New backgrounds, Gate Warden and Planner Philosopher. Ooh. New feats. <laughs> All right. Let's check out the Gate Warden. Really cool artwork. Must play in the Planescape campaign for this background. The OSR. Familiarize me with the, an acronym there, if you would. Old school, old school rules. Is that what you mean, maybe? Open source rules. Kate Towns, Outlands, custom experience that leave others really in terror and rapture another world with impunity, incredible deal with celestials and fiends, you are Avengers in town. Persuasion, survival, two of your choice, abyssal, celestial, or infernal, recommended. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've uh, played a little bit of Dungeon Crawl Classics. I haven't played, uh, I think there's Old School Essentials, I think, OSE, uh, Old School Essentials, I think. Very similar, um, that use, I'd like I know Dungeon Crawl Classic use a combination. I mean, their character sheets look like the old uh, basic D and D character sheets in a way, almost. Um, and they do uh, actually use the third edition saving throw type of thing. So you have your fortitude, uh, your will, and your uh, what is it? Fortitude, reflex, and will uh, will saves. Um, yeah, I mean, th those are great. Those are fun. Um, one of the things that's uh, I. I've played as a DM, played through all the different versions of, you know, being, you know, played where the players want to play it as a game of the players versus the DM, which is not really, I I, don't, I never really enjoy that because the DM is, is the golden rule of D&D. &D. The DM is always the final word. So the DM, you know, you're automatically uh, setting yourself up as the players to be disappointed. Um, I'm not one of the DMs also that I used to be. Uh, I'd be, like I said, I've been through all the different things where uh, as a DM, where you just let the dice fall where they may. And if the characters die, then the characters die or whatever. But I always had the idea of like, you know, you don't have a uh, character in, uh, you know, in a movie or a book that, you know, is the main character of the story. And then they walk into the very first random room and a random kobold kills them and they're out of the game. You know, that's, you know. I got to the point now where if, uh, if especially in homebrew, if a character is going to die or whatever, I always try to talk to play and try to make it something that's significant for the story uh, and never want to have it randomly uh, in that situation. Now there are lots of, like I like to uh, have the threat uh, like when a character is going down to make the, the combats and stuff like that uh, dramatical. Uh, but the, old, the OSR stuff is cool in the sense that uh, uh, it does harken back to a lot of the older style rules and things like that. But the whole, concept of uh you know tomb of horrors uh try to survive some of those types of things are fun and in, in of themselves but running a, a campaign uh, has become more my style now uh running a story that the characters uh get to grow in and the players get to have a lot of fun and see their character growth from where they started off and then looking back to where they ended up it's really cool Great place to go uh, for the uh, OSR stuff is uh, to GaryCon. Uh, GaryCon has lots and lots of the OSR uh, different style of play. You can even play AD&D there. Uh, people have been playing some of their AD&D campaigns for, you know, 30, 40 years. I actually update my own campaign world every time a new edition comes out. Uh, so I have what's called age or not uh, incursions. Um, 
as my game world's kind of a mixed mash of real world uh, medieval uh, cultures from all the different areas of the world mixed with uh, some low fantasy uh, around uh, the equator as you get farther. Because in my campaign world, magic kind of originates from the poles. And uh, because it's actually not in a crystal sphere like in uh, Spelljammer, uh, it's actually, you know, in a, like a parallel universe to our universe or whatever. And uh, magic is actually really only accessed from the planet itself. Once you get off world, uh, it's all spacefaring and psionics and stuff like that, you know. Um, so I always uh, I have adjusted my campaign world uh, every time a new edition comes out. I know some people have had campaign worlds that they've had, you know, hey, I've been playing first edition D&D and this campaign world has been going on, you know, and they've run their campaign uh, with their home players uh, that they've been playing with for, you know, 34 years, which is really cool, too. So you gave the style of the Scion, Scion, Scion of the Outer Plains feet. That's pretty sweet. Come on, let's go back there. There we go. Hmm. Let's go back to that uh, character options again. All right, I'm going to take a small little break here because she is not going to be quiet. She's deaf and uh, she's very uh, vocal, unfortunately. So I'm going to take a small little break and I'll be right back. All right, we've got her fed. <laughs> All right, let's check out some of these backgrounds. Let's see what background the uh, planet philosopher gets real quick first. I wish I would just open our new tab. <laughs> Ooh, faction. Oh, yeah, okay. The factions of Sigil. Her sea killers, oh yeah. So both of them get the sign of the Outer Plains feet. Nice, all right, let's check that out then. <laughs> yeah. 
agent of order. Fourth level, you must have the sign of the outer plane's feet for the feet trees that they're starting. Increase the ability score of your choice by one. Stasis strike. Once per turn, when you damage a creature, you can see within 60 feet of yourself, you can deal an extra 1d8 force damage to the target. Let's make a wisdom safe throw. Spectral Pining try to ensnare it. Hmm, that's really cool. Some of these I know uh, showed up in the uh, Unearthed Arcana uh, with the playtest material. They've kind of stopped doing the uh, old art uh, stuff and doing most of the new Unearthed Arcana has been playtest material for the new um, new books that will come out next year. Let's see what the side of the Outer Plains does again. She's type of plane listed in the planar infusion table. Your choice gives you resistance to a damage type and the ability to cast a cantrip. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Righteous Eridor. So whatever sign you pick, some of these uh, feats are only available to uh, whichever uh, plane, plane, uh, planar association you have. Oh, wow. Pretty cool. Your spells warp sense and gate seal. A couple new magic items. And several gazetteer factions, Lady of Pain, and the Outlands. That's the first book was be Sigil in the Outlands, and then your other book obviously is Mort's Planar Parade, which is bestiary. It's got the DM screen listed there too. <laughs> and then of course the adventure, uh, Turn of Fortune's Wheel, in the three box sets. what the DM screen looks like. Oh, it just has the things that are listed on there. Okay. <laughs> Hound Lantern and Warden Archons. Baron Aloth. Barrier Warrior. Cranium Rat Squeaker. Cream Rat Squeaker Swarm. Dabus Dabus. Dark Weaver. Dumadans. Eater of Knowledge. Oh. Gets the right futurist. Traveler Uniter. Cardinals. Avoral. Ekmanol. Must of all. Colyorut. The elephant. Some more Modrons. Nice.
Razor Vine Blight. Time Dragons, nice. Different uh, faction agents with the for the different factions in single. <laughs> that artwork is so cool too. Ancient Time Dragon. Let's check that out. Ooh. Dragons harness the power of time to manipulate the past, present, and future. Time dragon wormlings are born with shiny scales and have horns that are barely more than nubs. The master flow of time, their horns grow with branching rainbow hued veins, suggestive of time's path and possibilities. Ooh. You gonna get in your bed? I don't know why I'm saying that. You can't hear me. <laughs> There you go. She was 15 years old when we rescued her. She is, we've had her for four years. At least that's what the vets assumed because she was a stray. She had been fixed already by one of the animal shelters. And she's deaf, so she kind of latched onto me as like a protective thing. So she has separation anxiety if she can't find me. So that's why she's so loud. <laughs> You can't hear very, very low uh, frequencies. Oh, there she is. Okay. Nice. Uh, ancient time dragons can control temporal gates connected to specific times and places in the multiverse. Using these, they and the allied creatures can travel anywhere in time to affect fate determining moments or to banish threats from beyond the flow of time. As a result of their ability to travel between ages, time dragons often seem unstuck from the usual flow of time and have a flexible view of what is, what was, and what will be. Um, for, uh, for this release, for the new release of the new books of the 50th anniversary books next year, or are talking about with this release here for, uh, Planescape? Cause this, uh, Planescape is for fifth edition. So they're using the fifth edition, uh, tieflings.
They did have a few tiefling variants in the Morden Kane's Tome of Foes, I think it was, where you could play different tieflings from different uh, fiendish lineages. When a creature can see what says if you forward through time, the target must succeed on DC 18 wisdom save or take 4d12 psychic damage and move one round forward in time. A target moves forward in time vanishes for the duration. When the effect in the target reappears in the space it left, or I got space here is the place but not occupied. That brings up an interesting question for a dungeon master. Uh, if the character is thrown one round in time, say they're concentrating on a spell. Uh, do they lose one round of that? Uh, like, say, for example, they're concentrating on a bless. A bless lasts for 10 rounds, one minute. Uh, and they have two rounds left on their fling through time, and they move forward around. Do they only have one round left in the bless, or do they have two rounds left in the bless? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Let me go through and see. Uh, we can check through the... Uh... Let's put that over there. Maybe it'll let us. Um, didn't look like in the player in the character options they had anything different from the, for the uh, tieflings. Yeah, they didn't. Doesn't seem like they have any new races, uh, new uh, species, is what they're calling them next in the new uh, next release. Uh, now they didn't have any new uh, different uh, playable species in this. Like that, you would think they would when they had like a couple of them for a spell jammer. That was a very nice token as well. Let's see the stat block. CR twenty six. 536 hit points average. Five times a day, legendary resistance. Oh, wow. Dragon tape for three actions per round, but only one per turn. No legendary actions, huh? Interesting. Pretty cool time dragons. Let's do this. We'll open this up here. We'll pull this over to the side. That way we can... Uh... Actually, we'll have to keep, to keep accessing all the other ones that way. Um... Uh, remind me too, because like I said, I've been playing all these different editions. I always tell, ask, ask the players, uh, you know, to uh, like I always expect the players to know their character, or the players to know their characters better than I do, uh, since I have so many other things in my head. Like I sometimes forget, as teleport a uh, fifth level spell, it's a seventh level spell, what level spell, what edition are we playing? Um, so what what was the main difference? Uh, I can't really think off the top of my head the main difference between uh, Tieflings from 2nd Edition. I know I think they made them in 4th Edition was the first time that they became uh, actual, well, not 
playable, but actually uh, as a core species, uh, they still have it. Uh, obviously, in fifth edition, there in the uh, player's handbook as a playable uh, race for one of the core races. Um, but what were the big differences, if you recall? Chemeska. Oh, that looks awesome. <laughs> Charles Ray six. Oh, that's a really cool creature. Actually, I should could probably check this. Um Hmm. You lost, okay. Great waste of hate news. Player actions. CR seventeen. Very nice. Okay. 
Dark Weavers. I was in that first player handout, which is nice. It's the CR. Ten. Nice. Though the legendary resistance numbers being changed by some creatures, that way the players can't necessarily metagame how many uh, resistances they have. <laughs> Try not to heal the monster. <clears throat> Counts ready twenty two. Pardon me. Let's see what that token looks like. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and transmogrify the room that I normally have. Close the adventure real quick. That's nice. Somebody's multi sided, yeah. Sweet. Interesting. Sometimes a multiverse doesn't work as it should. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the physical fluctuations. That's what we were talking about earlier about the uh, players end up creating three um, characters. Let's see if that's in running the adventure. <clears throat> hmm, cool. <clears throat> <clears throat> My goodness. <clears throat> Milestones again, which is nice. Much part two can transpire in any order, which is nice. <laughs> so they got to be third level to start chapter one, fourth level to start chapter two, fifth level to start chapter three, sixth level to start chapter four, chapter five through 12. They will get up to ninth level to start all of those and then <clears throat> chapter 13 starts at ninth level chapter 14 at 10th level and then they advance to 17th to start chapter 15 interesting interesting stuff Very cool. All right. Well, um, we're going to go ahead and uh, call the shop for today. Um, we will be back tomorrow with some uh, Tavern Talks with the Shifty Board at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, where we're going to be going over uh, the rest of uh, the uh, Bastions and Cantrips uh, playtest packet 8 for 1 D&D or D&D 5.5, as it were. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, of course, to all of our supporters, especially our patrons for Patreon. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider becoming a patron or subbing here on Twitch, twitch.tv slash the Master of Dungeons. Uh, we'd love Prime subs as well. Uh, the link to our Patreon page as well as our YouTube channel on all of our social media accounts can be found in the About Us section below here on Twitch. <clears throat> if you would, subscribe to us on YouTube. It's free. Uh, like and comment on the videos. Uh, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, give us some likes, retweets, all of that good stuff. Every sub, like, and share helps us immensely. Uh, you can also support us by clicking on the About Us section below and click on the Discord panel and join the Master of Dungeons Community Discord server where you can help shape an accepting, caring, and inclusive D&D community. Uh, the merch store is open. We have some Master of Dungeons merchandise there, uh, some T-shirts, hoodies, stuff like that. It will definitely help us out uh, in supporting the channel. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, again, we will be back tomorrow, 2 p.m., uh, for uh, Tavern Talks with Shifty Boar. Uh, Thursday and Friday, we'll be back at uh, 2 p.m. as well for our Dungeon Delving stream. Uh, so have a wonderful rest of your day. Again, thanks for watching. And as always, happy adventuring. Take care.